Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Denise. I'm also, this is also my first time in Bushwick, practically. Art causes gentrification. Artists cause gentrification. That's pretty much it. That's all I'm going to tell you today. <laughs> I'll show you a few slides to demonstrate my point, or rather to illustrate my point that art causes gentrification. But why make the point? Why make the point? Why would, why, how does it behoove me to come out and say that, hey, I started gentrification at this late date in the gentrification wars when there are so many other usual suspects? Artists start gentrification. Um, it does not, nor does it really behoove me to, to, to claim for art that which belongs to Caesar, so to speak. I'm going to show you some slides of events in, over the past 30 years in Brooklyn that I think anticipate the kind of uh, super gentrified, super saturated uh, communities that are, that, are, that are forming the inner cities of our, of our cities today. That are, that are, this, is, this is gentrification. I don't want to mince words here. The transformation that we're talking about tonight is nothing less than the conversion of blue-collar, working-class neighborhoods into bourgeois professional neighborhoods. And this is no small thing. The role of artists in this is, I claim, owing to the fact that cultural capital is as powerful as the physical capital that follows it to the neighborhoods. So decades, decades before the realtors get into the game, decades before the politicians get on board, long before the baby carriages and the yoga studios show up, artists seed in the neighborhoods all of the essential elements that we need to get the neighborhood going, to gentrify the neighborhood. Now this is hard for artists uh, to, 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 to get a grip on sometimes because you say, how can I be so poor? And I work as a, work as a carpenter or a sheet rocker or a, uh, an art handler and I can't afford my rent and I have to move to Detroit. But it's because, and so how can I be implicated in gentrification? I am a blue collar worker as an artist, yet you may have a blue collar job but you make fine art in the neighborhood, and that's all you need to attract the company and the ambience that is required to put in place the process of gentrification. So I hold that our community, our constituency, is an industry. We are real. We are real. We have lived in Brooklyn for a long time, and we are part of the process of gentrification. And as I said, this does go back a long time. Here is Williamsburg in 1986. Some of the installations I will show you, some of the work, some of the happenings, anticipate, preview, the later, later urban design and notions that come, that come to fruition in Brooklyn. So that's something that happened illegally in a warehouse 25 years ago. A semblance of it may appear decades later as public civic art. And in this way, the settlement, the artist's settlements, actually put into place the process of gentrification, not only by settling the neighborhoods, not only by establishing their communities and their societies, but also in the aesthetic uh, deployment of what they do. Um, uh, one thing that I would like you to take note of here, because the point that I'm making is that there is, an, there is a philosophical connection, an aesthetic connection that runs through the, from, the, from the, the theories of art, the theories of aesthetics, right on into the whole ambit of, of uh, gentrification and the society of the gentrified uh, city. I want you to notice that a lot of this work, this is not storefront gallery, uh, uh, this is not a storefront gallery scene such as we had in the East, Vill East Village and still have in many neighborhoods in Brooklyn. This is, these are happenings, these are installations. This, is, this occurs outside of the gallery. Okay. outside of the institutions of art. You see, there's a, there is a good example of a work of, of Brooklyn 
uh, conceptual art that happens outside of the institutions of art, right? Because it's outdoors. In other words, the, the art is not, the art is, the art is not happening in a gallery, it's not happening in a museum, it's not happening in a music hall or any, any traditional venue of, of, uh, of culture. So as the radical artists who do this would have it, therefore, we are rebelling against the institutions of art and our art is taking place outside of the, outside of society, outside of the ordinary venues. So we wish, or else we wish it would be that way. What really happens, I think, is that the institutions of art simply go underground as well with the rest of us. So there, is, there may not be a gallery per se or a music hall per se, but these, these institutions follow us into the ruins. They follow us into the ruins and then they guide and coerce and help to install these ideas and the, these, these aesthetic values into the, into the overall uh, installation that is gentrification. So the gentrification occurs anyway with the help of bourgeois culture. 2001, crazy installation art on the waterfront. 1991, 1991, an object. In 1993, another object in 2015. The earlier work in, these, in this series is very, very often illegal. It takes place in illegal nightclubs. It's not licensed. And then later on, we see the same kinds of things happening in a civic context, so that, so that installation art uh, impromptu, improvised installation art now becomes um, uh, part of urban design, part of the, the policy of setting up the uh, neighborhood. This is here's a lounge. Antis this, is, it's, it's, this, is, this anticipates the, it anticipates the, uh, the, the gentrified life. It anticipates the kind of luscious, seductive types of condominiums and types of very free, hip, sort of life that we would like to have under gentrification, that we have under gentrification, that is coming to our cities. This is a lounge in uh, uh, more than 20 years ago. Now, the intentions here are noble, are noble. These are communitarian events. These are open. They are democratic. They, w they wish to explode the power. They wish to disseminate art and freedom all over the world. So there's no questioning of their intentions, but they the point is that their very presence, the very presence of these sensibilities is promising, promising to speculators and so on. So, and then we have installation art that mimics architecture, or architecture rather that mimics installation art. Flatland. Flatland again. And the dark, the deep dark under the, under, the, under the bridge is now illuminated and becomes a spectacle. Now this is Bedford Avenue in 1989 and 2009, before and after. That's my storefront on the left. That's my installation art, my modest installation art. It's uh, run of the mill, modest by the standards of the time. Now, I had, a friend, I had a friend on Bedford Avenue, a local guy, Eddie. Eddie, five generations, born and raised in Brooklyn. Eddie said, this is way back in the 80s, Eddie says to me one day, he says, you know, the thing about you is you're half street and you're half artist. It was a huge compliment from a guy. Like <laughs> huge compliment. And, you know, I was not that cool. I was about 10% street and 90% hubris. But uh, he was right in another way. He was right in a way that he didn't mean, which is that today I work at the intersection of art and urbanism, art and the street. And I am of the opinion that the whole study of the avant-garde, this is to say what we used to call avant-garde studies, the study of these, these sort of esoteric hermet hermetic cults of, of theory that would express themselves in art, when call it minimalism, conceptualism, the study of the avant-garde, that all of this is going in the direction of urbanism. It's going in the direction of urban studies. We're understanding urban avant-gardes as real facets of the urban fabric as it unfolds. And this relates to my 
strong feeling, really, that artists and art are, are an integral part of the process of gentrification. Again, understand, we're an industry. We're a community. We really live here. We really do affect change in these neighborhoods. Uh, people who think that you know, 1997 is a long time ago in the history of you know, Bohemian Brooklyn are really missing the, 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 uh, the fact of the amount of spade work that goes into preparing these neighborhoods for gentrification. And so I do, I do accept and acknowledge that, uh, that art causes gentrification. Um, I hang out with my, my, my buddies, my old bohemian buddies, and we, we talk, we grouse, we complain. I complain about gentrification with them. You know, these hipsters and yuppies and the neighborhood's cooked, man. You know, you know, it's toasted. It's toasted. It's no fun anymore. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to court with my landlord and all this stuff. But, you know, what I, what I don't share with my friends is, and what I do want to share with you, what I don't share with my friends, I do want to confess to you, is that gentrification does not stifle my creativity. It actually does not throw a wet towel over my, li over my life, and it's not a big surprise. I've been seeing it coming for a very long time. Uh, con to the contrary, what gentrification does for me is actually invigorates me. There is something inspiring about it. I feel very lucky to have been an artist in this city at this time, at a time of cataclysmic change. And we have been here before. We were here with, with Robert Moses. We were here when they tore the slums down in the, uh, in the Lower East Side. You know, Walt Whitman, I was here as you are now. <laughs> And so um, I, have, I have visions, hope, for things like an ecotopian Newtown Creek in the far future. And again, uh, the, 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 the subject is complicated. Uh, we will leave most of it, we will leave much of it to the French philosophers. But as I said, I. Uh, I uh, I do, I do accept, acknowledge that uh, gentrification is integral, uh, rather that art is integral to gentrification. They are, they are two heads of the same hydra. You know, maybe one of them is kind of a little head, but it's hideous all the same. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, have a wonderful day.